Hello, everybody. I am Baron Baptiste. Welcome to Disrupting the Drift. Now is the time to wake up, to awaken within yourself. This is a place where we can tell the truth and the truth can be told. David Masters, how you doing? Doing fantastic. Always when I'm with you, Baron, my, my consciousness is expanded. Let me put it to you that way. Oh, I love that. I love that, man. It takes two to create something bigger than the two of us. And then everyone listening, welcome, welcome to be a part of this transformative journey. Please subscribe, turn on the notifications and be at the forefront of change here with us. Share this with your friends, your family, and let's create a ripple effect of growth and spiritual transformation. It's time to awaken and enlighten. And that's why we're here. Your support is our strength. Leave us a five-star review or hit the like button. If you're watching on YouTube, you can watch these episodes at Disrupting the Drift on YouTube, Disrupting the Drift, Baron Baptiste, YouTube. And David, how's it going, man? The world is in one big psyop, huh? It is. The PSYOP is ongoing. It's, it, actually, it started in the Garden of Eden, if you want to know the truth. It started with a lie that was told to a, an unsuspecting and, let's say, an uninformed person about the truth about knowledge and the idea that if a person just had more knowledge, that would somehow elevate them into a position of Godhead. And so what we have in this world today is literally a psycho-spiritual warfare that's going on with the same kind of thing that we have. Knowledge-based answers that really aren't rooted in actual reality many times. Yeah. And you see them in the yard science. We believe that love is love, and we believe the science. And I was just reading to you earlier that Dr. Fauci has admitted now that the six-foot distancing that everybody had to endure was based on nothing. This was just a recent testimony that he gave in front of Rand Paul and others, I believe, in Congress. He just, these people just made this stuff up as they went along. They and just we make were puppets. shit up. They, yeah. We were puppets of this PSYOP. And so let me read to you the, the definition of psychological warfare. It says, psychological warfare is the planned tactical use of propaganda, threats, and other non-combat techniques used during wars, threats of war, or periods of geopolitical unrest to mislead, intimidate, demoralize, or otherwise influence the thinking or behaviors of an enemy. And now if you think about it, those of us who love the traditional values that this country was based upon, we have been categorized by those who are involved in trying to radically reorganize our thinking. We are the ones who are now looked at as the enemy. And the demoralizers are out there always picking away at us and trying to find ways to get us to conform to things that we instinctively and intuitively know are insane. So I'll just throw it back to you. Well, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's where two things. Knowledge. Knowledge killeth the spirit in a sense. Yes. It's so much not – we live in it an era, a world of just knowledge, information being sent our way. And uh, if you don't know who you are within yourself and you're in any kind of reaction, conscious or unconscious reaction to what the, to the outside, to what's coming at you on the outside, and if you're just buying into it, if you're gullible, if you're vulnerable, vulnerable, we, we could look it up in the dictionary, but it essentially means open to attack. If you're vulnerable and you're weak, and you don't know who you are, you don't have your own inner true north, you don't have some kind of connection to a higher being, including your beginning with your own being, <laughs> who are you? You're subject to the strongest forces without you rather than the force within you. And I think that this is where it's an opportunity to actually grow. I think it's the opposite polarity it takes friction. Great leaders, great teachers, the greatest teachers in history have all risen in during times of great friction. And I think this is an opportunity for us individually, each and everyone, 
including myself, you, me, everyone, has the opportunity to use this friction to not just get taken up by it and used by it, but to actually use it to grow yourself, to grow, to deepen your connection to your inner source, your creator, your God source. The, the, the issue at hand is, do you lose yourself in the ways of the world right now, or do you find yourself and actually strengthen yourself in your own values, in your own knowing, your higher intuition guiding you rather than buying into all of the forces without you. Nothing outside of us ultimately will fix us. But the world we live in, it, it almost trains us to, trains us and disciplines us and bombards us to conform to its ways. So I think there's something about not conforming, not being a conformist, and also not being a rebel, because if you rebel against it, you're in reaction and you lose yourself in the fight or you lose yourself in the submission, but to actually find the center, your own center. And that takes something, that takes a, a real commitment, a discipline, and a yearning for the truth. And only the truth can make us free and also keep us free. So I think part in part, it's like waking up and seeing where are you and what are you allowing in to your mind? Because if you're just like eating junk food, what you're allowing in your mouth, what you're allowing into your, your eyes, your ears, your environment, what you're taking in, if you just take it all in, you are a leaf in the wind. Yeah. Listen, your, your reference to knowledge killing, it's 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Let me read it. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim that anything comes from us, but our competence comes from God. And he has qualified us as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, and again, Jesus mm -hmm. talked about how there was, it, there, he was speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, in the, the, at the sacred well of, I think it was Jacob. And it was an amazing moment where he took time to break down barriers between people who would otherwise, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. And he told her, look, you don't have to worship here anymore because there's a time coming, which is in fact already here, that we will now worship in spirit and in truth. And this is what the psychological, psycho-spiritual warfare is all about, that there was a radical transformation that took place 2,000 years ago, and especially at the time that Jesus was transmuted at the time of his disappearance from the tomb. A new physics came into existence, a new other-dimensional physics that rules the world that we live in, even though the scientists of our day don't recognize what it is yet, there's a new physics, and that physics is based only on spirit and truth. It's not based on knowledge anymore. And that the idea that we can actually live our lives based on pretty much solely intuitive insights and not have to be relying upon those who provide us with knowledge. And by the way, in the Garden of Eden, the lie about the forbidden fruit, the lie was it was a deception. It was a psyop to get the person who was told not to consume the forbidden fruit to doubt. And so what we all have to deal with every single day of our lives are lies that are designed to make us doubt our own knowing, our own intuitive knowing. And that is the psyop. That's the psychological, psycho-spiritual warfare that we're involved in every single day. And what happens, interestingly enough, is that, um, for example, I told you earlier today, I've tuned out from the news. I don't care what's happening in the news anymore. But the news, whether it's on, from the left or the right, it's all the same information that's coming at you all the time. 
And same with social media. I don't participate in social media in any way, shape, or form. I don't want to be influenced by other people's thoughts to that extent where I'm constantly looking at other people, what they think they that you should do or shouldn't do. I don't care what other people think that I should do or shouldn't do. I care about what I know from my own intuitive grasp of reality. And what happens is when you step away from the forbidden fruit temptations of everyday life, the social media, the influencers, the news, you step away from that and your own consciousness, your own intuitive consciousness begins to magnify and you begin to see life as it is and not as the world will have you see it. it there's a radical shift that takes place, Baron, and I know you've seen it too. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, very good. I think that <laughs> the thing is, we, I don't know if we have choice. I don't know if it's choice, but it's, it's more of what pulls us. And I think if we're being pulled toward truth, okay, you can choose that. But I think it's, I can say, okay, I choose truth. But at the end of the day, it's what am I doing? How am I spending my hours? How am I spending my minutes? How are, how am I spending my moments? Am I using my time in a way that is a part of this bigger psyop where I'm just flipping through social media, losing time, losing energy, losing the, the very same attention and energy that could be put into developing myself, developing my body, you know, moving, breathing, physically strengthening myself, developing my mind, just having quiet moments or developing a skill, habits. What I do, I always like to say, first we make our habits and then our habits make us. But if you look at what habits are, they're practices. And what you practice over time, okay, five years out, what are you doing now in your life on a daily basis that if you look into five years, if you keep practicing what you're doing consistently for the next five years, is it moving you toward becoming the person you want to be spiritually? Are you deepening your understanding of yourself? Are you examining yourself every moment? of every waking hour is an opportunity to discover something about yourself, about life, or there's a dumbing down of society. At the group level, group think, if you're just being dumbed down or distracted or yet yeah, oh, taking in too much of just external content that actually is softening you, weakening you, and it, that is a practice. You're practicing weakening your mind. And in five years, where, what have you developed? It's really pretty simple, but it's getting clear on who are you actually, really, who are you in the essence of your being? Who does the, your creator, that greater author of the universe, who does he want you to be? And who are you being and what are you doing? Are you fulfilling on that calling, that pull towards something greater in yourself? Or are you following the pull of mediocrity, the sea of all the same? Go along to get along. Shush up, keep quiet, don't rattle, don't disrupt any drift, don't disrupt business as usual because you might risk what? What are you so afraid of risking? Is it income? Is it how people see you? Will you be rejected? People don't care about you as much as we think. And so we buy into other people's beliefs as a way to buy some peace, but you're really not buying peace. You're buying outer peace, perhaps, but inner agony, inner despair, inner depression, suppression, and disconnection from yourself. You don't get to be you when you're being formed from an outside world. And right now, the world is so driven by hate and fear 
that you better be finding and recovering your center on the daily, every day, or mm -hmm. you're at risk of really losing yourself. And again, what are you practicing over the period of time? Who are you becoming? What are you practicing? And there's no shortcut in life. There's no hack in life to discovering yourself and living that, living true by that, truing up to that on the daily. Yeah, I want to go back to what you said about people being pulled. Uh, John 644 says this, no one can come to me. This is what Jesus said. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. Mm -hmm. Now, th but see, it's the law of opposites. If there is a force that draws people to the truth, or let's say God, there's also a force, the opposite side of that is, there's a force that draws people away from God, away from the truth that sets them free. And this idea of being drawn and pulled, that's a very sacred thing in a manner of speaking, because to be drawn, it, it, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the movie E.T. And, but this is a, just a metaphoric example, is that he, in the movie, Richard Dreyfus has this vision of this landing on top of a, a mountain in Montana somewhere. And he, his whole life begins to be revolving. He starts making piles of mashed potato to resemble the mountain. There's something in him that is drawing him to a certain kind of destiny. And for me, it was like I was fascinated with the idea that he became obsessed with this idea that something was going to happen. See, I believe that in a way we all have the capacity to be drawn and to become in a way spiritually fixated on something that we can't see. In other words, it's a kind of faith. We can't see it. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know why it's happening. But at the same time, we feel this pull in our being. And this pull is trying to recover us from this, the insanity of the world that we've fallen into. And it keeps pulling at us. And we keep wondering, what is it that's pulling at me? Now, the flip side of that is the dark side will pull at us too. This is a psycho-spiritual warfare. It, it uh, is always trying to erode your sense of what you know intuitively is right in your own heart. And it, it wants to make you doubt. And because through doubt, that's the ultimate mechanism of trickery, to doubt your own sensitivity. In other words, and, and there are people, it, it, strangely enough, people that will allow their children to become trans, people that say, oh, it's okay if little Johnny wants to be a girl today or a boy. Those people have lost their ability to be drawn by the truth. The truth is, is an alien to them. And this other alien force that's drawing people away from their natural state is constantly tugging away at them. And then they find themselves being reinforced by others who believe the same things. And so they're drawn toward those who are in great and horrifying denial about what is actually real and reality itself, Baron. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's reality, there's truth, and there's lies. I think before, for me, I was going to speak to the pandemic for a minute. Yeah. Before the pandemic, life was much more free in society, I would say. We could drift along. We were living more in a lot of ways in a bubble, though. And I think the blessing for me when, of the pandemic in a way, it, it, it was a forced quit. And it, it forced me to stop and get present to, okay, I've been living in a lot of ways that just aren't real. A lot of, not, what I mean by that is not related to reality. And I think that's always been available to us. Before the pandemic, I, I would drive through the streets of Los Angeles and New York, big cities, and I'd look, go through the driving by the residential areas, and I'd know, I would just intuitively know most of these people are living in hell, like their own personal hells. You could, you're flying in an airplane over a big city and looking down, and <clears throat> not all people, but so many, and the majority of people are living in their own kind of hell, and they don't know it. And I think what the pandemic did, it took the lid off. 
And now you see that what's coming out, what's come out spiritually, they call it mental health or mental illness. There's all, there's such a huge problem now with mental health. Okay. Is that really new or is that really exposing? Is it ex what's already there exposed? You squeeze an orange and you get orange juice. We squeeze a human being. <laughs> what do we get? And I think the world has squeezed what happened during the pandemic and all of this like lockdown and all of this. Maybe initially it was a reaction by the government to shut things down and play it safe. But then suddenly the powers that be realize, oh, we've got power right now. They didn't want to give up that power. So it's like you bring a Fauci now stating, okay, six foot distance, social distancing is, it was made up. It, there was no science behind that. There was no reason for that. Okay, maybe very initially early on, play it safe. But then they really held on to all these things. And what, the, what that did is it forced people, it forced human beings into corners. People got cornered and they didn't know what, people don't know what to do with themselves. So what you start seeing is all this burning, boiling, brewing pot of resentment and being, having lost oneself and not knowing how to deal with just being with oneself or being with one's husband or wife or family or in society. And you see this ugly nature coming up in human beings. Human beings have a choice. You live in hell or you don't. And again, I don't know if it's a choice. I, I, I lean towards saying it's some kind of inner commitment. And I think more than most people, and I don't know what the number, let's say 80% of people have a pull toward goodness, toward being good human beings, whole human beings, doing the right thing, optimizing their life and being the best version of themselves. Just naturally, it's there. But the bleed over from the collective of just this ugly nature rising up, weak people, including all the good people <laughs> who have some inner commitment toward bettering themselves and being the best version of themselves, lost themselves. They've lost themselves in this collective kind of group think. And it, it's like fungus. Being nasty as a human being or that ugly nature you give into, that spreads like fungus. It, it just as goodness does, goodness spreads as well. And I think that's what we're up to here. But we're doing this by, by confronting the truth. You have, to look, you have to look. The first truth is often ugly. The first truth about ourselves is often mm -hmm. and typically ugly, nasty. And you have to be okay with seeing that. And if you have that commit, inner commitment to grow and to be the better person, you stop, you pause, you check in. You have some remorse for maybe how you've been being in life, what you've been doing in life. Wait, stop. Give all that up. Repent. Let it go. Step in front of it. Cry out to your creator. Cry out for higher guidance. Begin anew. Start anew. And we can do that right now. This day, this moment. Get present to a higher, a greater presence. And in that greater presence, you're no longer subject to knowledge, head knowledge, or outer knowledge, what you're being fed. Suddenly, you have access to an inner knowledge, a more a profound knowledge, that an inner guidance where you think for yourself and you actually then begin to see that you're thinking. And I think this is how most people actually operate. They actually don't agree with what's out there, but they give into it out of a kind of weakness, but it takes something in one's commitment. It takes a discipline and discipline in the sense of being a disciple to something greater than yourself. Mm -hmm. One last thing, let, let me just yeah. throw this in. You brought up earlier the tear, I'll call it tear down culture yeah. or people that are about tearing down institutions, tearing down others, tearing down 
what has been built in, in our country, in America, over, over decades and hundreds of years, you, it, it's these people that are tearing things down and tearing down anything that w- was once important to who we are, what created this greatest nation on earth. You, but that there's something in these people that's reckless because they don't know what they're creating. That's my greater fear and concern is people that are in all this teardown, it started out, okay, just, it's been going on for years, obviously, but now it's so amplified, this teardown culture that these people are reckless and that they don't realize when you tear down the very fabric of, and you, of the life you're now the privilege to get to live and enjoy you don't realize what you're setting yourself up for, not just the people that you hate and resent and envy and you want to tear those people down. You're tearing yourself down and your life, quality of life along with it. There's a kind of recklessness that's driven by emotion. And in that, when you're driven by emotion, you're connected to dark forces and you don't realize you're a willing or likely an unwilling dupe Mm -hmm. you're a pawn in some greater evil at work and what we all are left with including the very people in starting at the top in the white house down in politics media social just community social media people don't realize what's being torn down at a certain point can't be recovered. And what you're left with is a very scary world. Yeah, look, you've made some incredibly important points. And I just want to, I want to focus for a moment on the idea that most people have this belief, and it is an illusion, that they are themselves autonomous, meaning that they can function without any regulation from any sort of external or internal force. But imagine this. Imagine that you are on a speedboat, and all of a sudden the the person who's driving the boat falls overboard. Now the boat goes on without any control over its direction. And if you think about it on a a level of physics or any other natural forces that are at work on everything, there is a force at work on every single thing that causes it to be what it is by design. So in nature, and there's a lot of people who love nature. Okay, I love nature. But one of the things we have to realize is there are forces at work within the natural world that are causing things to happen. And then when they assign this idea that humans can cause global existential global warming or whatever you want to call it, what we're doing is we're actually beginning to get real about whether or not there are forces at work on everything. Now, I don't believe in uh, human caused global warming. I think it's another one of those great lies that are that is told, although I think people can have an influence. The point is we are not mutually exclusive in the sense that we are not being acted upon by one force or another. And what you're saying is very important because the cancel culture that causes the, what you call like a virus that spreads from one person to another because people are willing to capitulate or they're willing to compromise. And then you made a super important point, which is that goodness has a, a similar effect on people that when there is goodness in another person, that has an exponential effect, which means that there is no way around being influenced by either one thing or another. And so I go back to John six forty four. No one can come to me, Jesus said, unless the Father who sent me draws them. We are being pulled upon all the time. And our conscience, when, once we kill our conscience, then we are lost forever. Once we kill that sense of things that you said, most people don't agree with it, but they go along with it anyway. At least there's still some sense of, this doesn't make sense to me, like the six-foot distancing. It never made sense to me. If we have a deadly disease and you're standing six foot from somebody that's got it, are you really safe? That was my most basic thought about it. But we are always being influenced by one 
force or another. And the inclination toward good is the only hack there is. And through the be still and know, what the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. That's the only hack there is back to reality. Because Mm -hmm. the brain is constantly manufacturing thoughts and ideas and feelings and directions and nonsense. But to be still and know brings you back to cause. It brings you back underneath cause. To stand under, to understand, to be still and know is the essence of the only hack there is to recover you from a world full of confusion and dark influences, Darren. Yeah. Yeah. No, very good. The, you're pointing to meditation and to be still and it's painful. I know <laughs> it, it's, it, what is it? It's, you get still, you sit still and suddenly you're bombarded with all these thoughts and emotions and feelings and body sensations and images. And you be with that in the face of stillness, and it, it's actually the truth is right there. Yeah. And that's painful often. It, it's a kind of pain, right? Again, the Khalil Gibran, the pain you feel is the breaking yes. of the shell that encloses yeah. you. Yeah. But it's like taking your spankings in a sense. <laughs> it, you, you're letting your life catch up with you when you get still, when you get quiet. And you get present to what's actually going on with you and what's actually driving you or where maybe better said is where you're living from, the forces, the energies that you're living from. But in that moment, in those moments of stillness and quiet, you suddenly have access to another realm, a realm of reality. And and I know for myself, sometimes when I sit it's like my mind's just running. It's just going. The emotions, it's all the internal machinery is just going. But I just stay quiet and I stay present in the face of it. And it suddenly starts, mo- that energy starts moving. It starts dissipating, evaporating out of my system. And suddenly I'm in a new world, a new realm. Maybe it's the same world, but I now have new eyes, a new relatedness. I'm coming from a new place, a new space. It's a transformation in a moment. Is it in in somewhere, is it, was it Jesus said, be therefore transformed by the renewing of your mind from within? Yes. And it's- Do not conform to the patterns of this world. Yeah. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not from the outside world. Perfect. You know. Be there, yeah. Yeah, perfect, right? Conforming to the outside world or going for the transformation within. And that's available to all of us, all of the time, everywhere. Not when we just sit and get quiet, but the sitting and getting quiet to me is a demonstrate. It's a demonstration. It's demonstrative of a discipline. Again, to being a disciple of something greater beyond just my own thoughts, feelings, emotions, images, just all the inner workings, the inner machinery that's just running. It's because that's hell living from that. And the only way you can end up having to able to deal with that is either go crazy or find ways to numb it, distract from it, stay ahead of it. But it's always there chasing you. The only way out is through. And maybe there's not even truly a way out. It's just through. And I invite all of you listening, get quiet, get still, get connected to that, the inner promptings of your conscience and, and live in congruence with your conscience, that inner knowing. It's the only way that is from the in, inner self, living from the outer self. Just be careful. Be careful what you let in. Be careful what you take in because it'll take you. I think this is a great place to wrap up. Any last thought, David? I do. And it has to do with this idea of getting quiet. And what the admonition of the scripture, be still and know that I am God, has to do with something 
very fundamental that most people actually have a resistance to, and that is the word surrender. And mm -hmm. just one of, the, one of the definitions of the word surrender means to give oneself over to something such as an influence. Now, what we've been doing, whether or not we've been surrendering to this, the influences of the world and the dark forces that are just there all around us without realizing it, is that to stop long enough to realize through the meditation, through getting quiet, through, through letting go of your connection to that source allows you a space to be reoriented and to give yourself over to something such as an influence. Now, what is the influence of the silence, of the stillness? From that comes a new kind of knowing, a, a new kind of identity. And as the scripture says, don't conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind from within. So that becomes the living well from which you drink. The surrender of that self, that ego self, that constantly is in, in a delusion that we are autonomous. We are not autonomous. We are subject to one of two forces at all times. And when we get to that place where we're willing to surrender, just the very idea that we can do whatever we want, if you can surrender that, a new life begins to form in that very moment. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. All right, my friends, keep disrupting and rising above the drift. Challenge the norm of your own life. Challenge the norm of your own thinking and create a new narrative for your life. Again, first you make your habits make you, but do the thing. As Emerson said, do the thing and get the power. Peace out, y'all. Stay blessed, stay true, stay bold, and share the show. Until next time, peace be with you.